Well, depending on what time of year it is, what season we're in, can certainly dictate what type of precipitation we see with various storms. But this is a typical track of a low pressure system moving into the Great Lakes region, off to the east coast, and plenty of moisture associated with it. How do we come up with these names of these storms? You've probably heard them. The Alberta Clipper? Well, it has to do with where they originate from. So the Alberta Clipper starts with specific moisture interacting with Arctic air. It takes a trajectory sort of like this through the Great Lakes. Colorado Low forms in the lee of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, tracks east-northeast through the Great Lakes. A panhandle hook actually uh, can bring snow as far down as Texas, and it kind of moves like that, and you can see why they call it a hook. And a nor'easter, which is very common in the winter, Atlantic Canada often gets storms as that storm or that low tracks up to this weather. Well, the Earth is always in motion. We have tectonic plate movements, such as oceanic plates and continental plates that are either pushing together, causing a ruckus, or pulling apart and creating new Earth. And as a result of all of this activity, we have natural hazards like this, an earthquake and volcanoes, that sort of thing. Let's talk a little bit about where the latest one happened on Monday. It was on the West Coast in California. You hear all kinds of people talk about the amount of earthquakes they see. Uh, we have about 15,000 earthquakes that are about this strength, 4.4 magnitude, that happen every day. But this one was felt by many. There was quite a bit of shaking just northwest of Beverly Hills. I have a friend who lives there, and he said it was the strongest quake that he felt since he lived there since 2008 in Los Angeles. So why does it happen in California? Why does it happen in the Pacific Basin? You always hear about it along the Marianas Trench, the Aleutian Trench, and those areas that you see there on that map. Well, it all has to do with a big oceanic plate called the Pacific Plate. And that is moving against the North American plate where California is located. The Juan de Fuca plate moves into where Vancouver or the rest of BC is. And then the Cocos plate down into Mexico. They're pushing underneath that continental plate and lifting the earth ahead of it. And that can cause some devastating earthquakes. This one, San Francisco 1906, was the strongest one. It was measured 7.8 magnitude. And it would have cost $5.6 billion in damage in today's dollars. Thanks, Jacqueline. Yeah. Well, happy St. Patrick's Day. There's some green in the Science Behind the Weather intro, and there's some green lights behind us. Uh, Gina Ressler joins me to talk a little bit about, uh, not this winter, but two winters ago, and I think that could make people feel a little blue, because <laughs> this is not good news. I know. It's such a contrast to this year, but totally. you know, if you were in southern Ontario two years ago, do you remember these types of temperatures? I do. Just about a week straight of temperatures into the mid-20s. Yeah, and I mean, even places down in Windsor, we're looking at Humidex readings that day. Mm -hmm. It was actually hot and sticky. Yep. And yeah. then, now ready? This is the bad news. <laughs> wah, wah. Then let's show you, yep. as of 7 a.m. today, minus teens breaking records right through the province. Yeah, and you know, this has been the story all winter. It's mm -hmm. kind of the winter and the cold that won't let up. And we're seeing it even as we approach the beginning of astronomical, astronomical spring. That's right, which is uh, Thursday mm -hmm. at 12.57. Uh, March 20th, sometimes it happens on or around the 21st. So yeah, is it gonna feel like spring by then? <laughs> We're gonna see what Gina has to say. But look at this, this is this morning, this is in the East Coast. Again, that purple, what's that representing? So this, are, this is again that cold Arctic air that affected Ontario and Quebec this morning. That's going to be affecting uh, Atlantic Canada over the next day or so as well. Right, so mm -hmm. everybody's going to get a dose of this mm -hmm. cold. Now, here's the good news. We did dodge a bullet in much of the eastern parts of Canada because of this storm. We're seeing snow, mixed precipitation, possibility of some severe weather down into Florida. Gina, how close did this get to southern Ontario and then into the uh, Atlantic provinces? Well, this is actually a pretty significant snowstorm for many parts of the U.S. eastern sea. Board, uh, Washington, D.C. Thankfully, we're kind of out of, of most of that precipitation uh, up towards southern Ontario. And that's because of that high pressure ridge that's up here. That's good news. Maybe it's cold, but it's keeping the storm south of us. However, we are watching this one. What can we expect with this next uh, big piece of energy? Yeah, so here's the next system kind of developing right now through uh, Idaho, Montana. That's going to be swinging through uh, Ontario Tuesday night into Wednesday. Mm -hmm. It's actually going to raise our temperatures a little bit through the east. Let's show you. This is so, There's some hope. So 7 degrees for Toronto looking at some rain so a lot of the snow melt will really start to uh, happen mm -hmm. but I think what everyone wants to know is what's happening with our spring so let's go to one of these uh, models this is the Canadian model mm -hmm. you tell us what this represents <laughs> all right so now we're heading into late week so about Thursday Friday there's our next piece of very cold air I know this is not what we want to see no not really getting into mid to late March but that's first going to affect the prairies okay. so Friday into
into Saturday, those temperatures dropping as this uh, kind of area of cold air starts to make its way east. So Ontario and Quebec, that's another shot of really cold air into about next uh, Sunday, Monday. And like, you know, for example, Ontario's, uh, most of their daytime highs should be around four or five degrees right now. Yeah. We're going to be way below seasonal still for the next few weeks. Thanks for your analysis, Gina. Stay with us. We'll have a look at your local forecast at six. Well, we've all seen a sky like that. Not a cloud in the sky. And be it winter or summer, that usually means we are under the influence of high pressure. And when we think about low pressure, we often think about storms or cloudy, rainy conditions, snowy conditions. High pressure, quite the opposite. So how, why does this happen? Well, a high pressure area means that air is not rising, but it's actually sinking. It has a lot to do with what's going on in our upper atmosphere. So if air is converging together aloft, well, then it has nowhere to go. It can't go up because that's space, so it has to go down. So it sinks, and when it sinks, it actually warms as opposed to low pressure where air is converging at the surface and we have rising air and that means the temperatures are cooling with height we get condensation we get clouds and then often we get stormy conditions as opposed to clear conditions in high pressure it's saint patrick's day and it's cold both of those things trending on social media i don't think the green shorts i've packed for this occasion will be coming out today yeah i don't think so either keith take a look at this picture now this is stateside but still look at all that snow with that happy saint patrick's day sign next picture so cute this is in new zealand but i just had to show you how sweet is that little pop belly pig uh, just asked for a cup of green cocoa because it is so cold this morning for St. Patrick's Day. Cold weather is still really bad in true New York. This is what we're talking about with spring and St. Patrick's Day. Yep, unfortunately.